Although many countries struggle with social and economic inequality, perhaps nowhere else in the world has inequality been so elaborately constructed as in the Indian institution of the caste system. The caste system has long existed in India, but in the modern period, it has been severely criticized by both Indian and foreign observers. Although some educated Indians tell non-Indians that the caste has been abolished or that no one pays attention to the caste anymore, do such statements reflect reality? What is the caste system? When did it start? And how does it affect India today? And is it just another form of slavery? Let's try and find out. Hello, I'm Mike Joberg, a Marine Corps veteran and filmmaker, and we will try to answer these questions on today's episode of Forgotten History. The caste system is a method of dividing up society into a hierarchy according to professions and trades. Individuals are assigned a caste at birth based on the caste of their parents. Castes and property are handed down from generation to generation, and marriages usually occur within castes. Indians can often quickly size up the caste of a stranger by the color of their skin, manner of dress, surname, occupation, and village or neighborhood from which they hail. The caste system is technically illegal, but still widely practiced. The Hindu social division system comprises of four major categories, or varnas, that are found India-wide, but are often subdivided into hundreds of subcategories, many of which are found only in specific areas. According to the Rig Veda sacred texts that date back to oral traditions of more than 3,000 years ago, progenitors of the four ranked varna groups sprang from various parts of the body of primordial man, which Brahma, the Hindu creator god, created from clay. Each group had a function in sustaining the life of society. Brahmins, or priests, were created from the mouth. They were to provide for the intellectual and spiritual needs of the community. Kshatriyas, warriors and rulers, were derived from the arms. Their role was to rule and protect others. Vaishyas, landowners and merchants, sprang from the thighs and were entrusted with the care of commerce and agriculture. Shudras came from the feet. Their task was to perform all manual labor. Later conceptualized was a fifth category, the untouchables. Menials relegated to carry out dirty and polluting work related to body decay and dirt. Since 1935, untouchables have been known as scheduled castes, referring to the listing on government rosters or schedules. They are also often called by Mahatma Gandhi's terms, Arajans or children of God. Although the term untouchables appears in literature produced by these low-ranking castes in the 1990s, many politically conscious members of these groups prefer to refer to themselves as Dalit, a Hindu word meaning oppressed or downtrodden. The dual concepts of karma and dharma lie at the heart of Hinduism and the caste system. The Hindu belief in reincarnation ties in with the caste system in that if an individual behaves himself within the confines of his caste, he will return in the next life in a higher caste. It is one's karma, or actions in life, that determines one's caste in the next life. The only way to ensure a better position in the next life is to follow one's caste or dharma and perform good deeds to gain karma. It has been said that Hinduism without caste is a contradiction in terms. The word caste comes from the Portuguese word casta, meaning breed, race, or kind. It was used by the Europeans to describe the system they witnessed when they came to South Asia covers both the indigenous terms of Varna and Jati. It has also been argued that the caste system developed in a manner similar to the European guilds. Workers were protected from competitions and skills were handed down from generation to generation by keeping job skills within the families and communities. Some have also suggested that the lower caste jobs and segregation were created for health reasons. The people who handled dead animals, for example, would not pass on diseases to people of other castes if they did not have contact with them. The origin of the caste system may also have evolved from differences between the conquering Aryans and the subjected Dravidians, which happened to be of different skin color. Aryans were relatively light-skinned, while Dravidians were darker. Varna, the Hindu word for caste, means color. The 
caste system is believed to have been introduced in its preliminary form around 1500 BC as a way for the light-skinned Aryan invaders to keep the indigenous Dravidian people in their place. Higher castes are usually associated with whiter skin and pure Aryan descent because, it has been argued, the first light-skinned Aryan conquerors gave the conquered dark-skinned Dravidians dirtier, lower-status tasks. This period saw the evolution of the caste system and the emergence of kingdoms and republics. The Aryans were divided into tribes which had settled in different regions of northwestern India. Tribal chiefdom gradually became hereditary, though the chief usually operated with the help of advice from either a committee or the entire tribe. With work specialization, the internal division of the Aryan society developed along caste lines. DNA studies of Indians have found that the highest caste members have more genetic similarities with Europeans, while lower caste members have more genetic similarities with Asians. This is consistent with the historical record of the Aryan invasion and links between the Aryans and members of higher castes. Some have suggested that the caste may have originally been a Dravidian concept rather than an Aryan one. One argument for this is the lack of a caste system in other areas conquered by the Aryans, such as Greece. The caste system creates a very stratified society. Indians are keenly aware where they stand in society, and who ranks above them, and who they outrank. Family names, village addresses, and gestures all offer clues to one's caste. Sukhadio Thorat, a professor at Jawaharwak University in New Delhi and one of the first untouchables to obtain a PhD, told National Geographic, You cannot hide your caste. You can try to disguise it, but there are so many ways to slip up. A Hindu will not feel confident developing a social relationship without knowing your background. Within a couple of months, your caste will be revealed. One untouchable told National Geographic, I am clean. I don't smoke or drink or eat meat. I work hard. I do everything right. Why am I untouchable? It is because he was born one and has been one since he drew his first breath and remains one until his life sentence on earth is finished. The chastity of women is also strongly related to the caste status. Generally, the higher ranking the caste, the more sexual control its women are expected to exhibit. Brahmin brides should be virgins, faithful to one husband and celibate in widowhood. By contrast, a Dalit bride may or may not be a virgin Extramarital affairs may be tolerated, and if widowed or divorced, the woman is encouraged to remarry. For higher castes, such control of female sexuality helps ensure purity of lineage, which is of crucial importance to the maintenance of high status. In past decades, Dalits in certain areas, especially parts of the South, had to display extreme deference to high status people, lest their touch or even their shadow pollute others. Wearing neither shoes nor any upper body covering, even for the women, in the presence of the upper castes. The lowest ranking Dalits had to jingle a bell in warning of their polluting approach. In much of India, Dalits were prohibited from entering temples, using wells from which the clean castes drew their water, or even attending schools. In the past centuries, dire punishments were prescribed for Dalits who read or even heard the sacred texts. Such degrading discrimination was made illegal under legislation passed during British rule and was protested against by pre-independence reform movements led by Mahatma Gandhi, B.M. Rao Ramji, Ambedkar, a Dalit leader. Dalits fought for the right to enter Hindu temples and to use village wells and effectively pressed for the enactment of stronger laws opposing disabilities imposed on them. After independence, Ambedkar almost single-handedly wrote India's constitution, including key provisions barring caste-based discrimination. Nonetheless, discriminatory treatment of Dalits remains a factor in daily life, especially in the villages, even today. In modern times, as in the past, it is virtually impossible for an individual to raise his own status by falsely claiming to be a member of a higher ranked caste. Such a ruse might work for a time in a place where the person is unknown, but no one would dine or intermarry with such a person or his offspring until the claim was validated through kinship networks. Rising on the ritual hierarchy can only be achieved by a caste as a group over a long period of time, principally by adopting behavior patterns of the higher ranking groups. This process is known as Sanskritization. An example of such a behavior is that of some leather worker castes adopting a policy of not eating beef in hope that abstaining from the defiling practice of consuming the flesh of sacred bovines would enhance their caste's status. Increased economic prosperity for much of the caste greatly aids in the process of improving rank. 
In the village, members of different castes are often linked in what has been called the Jajmani system, which in some regions means patron. Members of various castes perform tasks for their patrons, usually members of a dominant, more powerful landowning caste of the village, commonly castes of the Keshitriyas. Households of service castes are linked through hereditary bonds to a household of patrons, with the lower caste members providing services according to the traditional occupational specializations. Thus, client families of launderers, barbers, shoemakers, carpenters provide customary services to their patrons in return for which they receive customary seasonal payments of grain, clothing, and money. Ideally, from generation to generation, clients owe their patrons political allegiance in addition to their labors, while patrons owe their clients protection and security. Some observers feel that the caste system must be viewed as a system of exploitation of poor low-ranking members by more prosperous high-ranking groups. In many parts of India, land is largely held by the dominant castes high-ranking owners of property that economically exploit low-ranking landless laborers and poor artisans, all the while degrading them with the ritual emphasis on their so-called God-given inferior status. In the early 1990s, blatant subjugation of lower caste laborers in the northern state of Bihar and the eastern Uttar Pradesh was the subject of many news reports. In this region, scores of Dalits who have attempted to unite to protest low wages have been the victims of lynchings, and mass killings by high caste landowners and their hired assassins. In 1991, the news magazine India Today reported that in an ostensibly prosperous village about 160 kilometers southeast of Delhi, when it became known that a rural Dalit laborer dared to have a love affair with the daughter of a high caste landlord, the lovers and their Dalit go-between were tortured, publicly hanged, and burnt by the agents of the girl's family in the presence of some 500 villagers. A similar incident occurred in 1994 when a Dalit musician who had secretly married a woman of the Kermi cultivating caste was beaten to death by outraged Kermis, possibly instigated by the young woman's family. The terrified bride was stripped and branded as punishment for her transgression. Dalit women also have been the victims of gang rapes by the police. Many other atrocities as well as urban riots resulting in the deaths of Dalits have occurred in recent years. The caste is technically illegal. However, in modern white-collar offices, Brahmins and other upper-class members often hold the supervisory positions and the untouchables still clean the toilet. Many foreign companies operate under a don't-ask-don't-tell policy when it comes to caste. Despite many problems, the caste system has operated successfully for centuries, providing goods and services to India's many millions of citizens. The system continues to operate, but changes are occurring. India's constitution guarantees basic rights to all its citizens, including the right to equality and equal protection before the law. The practice of untouchability, as well as the discrimination on the basis of caste, race, sex, or religion, has been legally abolished. All citizens have the right to vote, and political competition is lively. The caste has indeed undergone significant change since independence, but it still involves hundreds of millions of people. In its preamble, Indian's constitution forbids negative public discrimination on the basis of caste. However, caste ranking and caste-based interaction have occurred for centuries and will continue to do so well into the foreseeable future. Let us know your thoughts about the caste system. Do you consider it a form of slavery or not? Thank you for watching Forgotten History. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you have any comments or show ideas, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks again.